Today, we are going to close the book on the theoretical aspects of Haskell, because today we are going to talk about monads. Now, monads for a lot of people are this magical thing that nobody can explain right and nobody really understands, but that really isn't the case. As we can see here, when we look at the info for monads, and if we look at the comments saying what the minimal function is that we need to uh, have for a monad, we see that there is only one function that we actually need in order to have a monad. So this means that if we understand this one function, we should be able to understand monads. Um, but actually, we are going to look at uh, three functions here. We are going to look at return, the greater greater, and the greater greater equals. But let's make another observation right now. Maybe and I.O., the types and the I.O. actions that we have seen before, are monads. So this is really interesting because we have worked with monads before, we just didn't know. Okay, so let's look at the very important thing, this greater greater equals operator. It is also called bind. And it works like this. We get a monad of type A and a function A to monad B and then we get a monad B. So this is interesting because as we can see here, we get the internal type of the monad. So in the case of a maybe, right, a just one has the internal value one. And an IO action, for example, also has some internal value. Uh, get line has some internal string. So this bind operator seems to be able uh, to extract that value. The question is, how does it do it? Well, let's look at two examples with the maybes. A just one is just what we expect. We have the internal value one, and then uh, we have this anonymous function here that gets this one as its x argument, and then just puts it back into a just. Why not? But then the interesting thing is a nothing with this bind operator gets us a nothing. Now... This seems to be weird, because why is that the case? Shouldn't we get a value? Well, no, because a nothing doesn't have an internal value. And of course, it depends on how you define this bind operator. But since a nothing encapsulates some error state very often, you know, it encapsulates that you have nothing uh, in your hands, then it shouldn't return anything but a nothing. Okay, so now that we know that, why not write a function with this, which we will call maybe add, which takes a maybe of x and a value y, and then adds them together. The important thing is that we still have to return a maybe after this, right? Otherwise, we are not uh, don't have a sound type because the bind operator has to return a monad. So we just return this uh, just of the sum of those two values. So as we can see here, if we do some adding with a nothing, we actually get a nothing, which is what we want because we cannot add to a nothing. So the error... Uh, if some error happened, is propagated. And if we have a just of 1, for example, and we add a 1 to it, we get a just 2. So this works just as expected. From this, we can build something even crazier, where we do this with two maybes. Now we have two maybes that we use the bind uh, operator on in order to get the internal values, and then we sum them together and uh, throw them into the just constructor. Again, even though I don't have a, a example here, if the second argument is nothing, we get nothing. If the first argument is nothing, we get nothing. We only get a just of any value if... Um, the two values we throw in here are justs. Okay, so now we've seen that we can do it like this, but remember, there was this one function in the um, monads, which was called return, and return should take a value and then return the monad of that value. So maybe also has to have a return, of course, because otherwise maybe wouldn't be a monad. So we can use return here. And that is true. But now let's look at something interesting because the type actually changes. 
So the most general type that we have now is a monad of bees to a monad of bees to a monad of bees. Now, this still works with maybes, right? Because instead of a monad, you can write a maybe because maybe is a monad. But now you could also use this on IO ins. And you can use this on any monad that has the internal, uh, internal type that is in this num type class. So you could use anything, basically. You could use a reader, you could use some, some network sockets. If you get a number out of the monad, you can use it with this maybe add function. And now we can think about renaming this function uh, leading up to the best joke of this whole series. We will call this function monad with two Ds because it's a monadic add. Right, that was worth it. Okay, so let's look at this function again. And when looking at this function again, we maybe see that, okay, if we want to now use even more monads, if we want to have even more arguments, this syntax becomes really convoluted and a bit ugly because we are using this um, operator, this bind operator, all the time with an anonymous function definition. This is not really the way to go, is it? And no, it isn't, which is why there is an alternative syntax that we have already seen, and it's the do notation. Because if you have a binding where you say, well, the monad m gets bound to this anonymous function with the argument x, this is the same in the do notation as saying, well, x with this uh, left arrow uh, m, which says nothing but, well, take the value of the internal value of m and put it into x and then do something else. But again, remember, if there is a faulty state in our monad, so for example, if the maybe is nothing or if an io has some internal exception, then we actually, because the do notation is nothing but the bind operator, then we actually propagate this error through. So we don't have to think about errors in this case. We, we always think about getting a value, but we can be sure that if there's an error, if, for example, a nothing is returned, then this is just propagated through. So this is great because this lets us build pure functions that can still handle errors and exceptions that happen on the side. Right, and using do notation, we can actually rewrite this uh, monad function, and it looks like this. And let's just go through it. We have the monads uh, x and y, uh, the monads mx and my, of course, and we get those values with x uh, left arrow mx and uh, y left arrow my, and then we return the sum of those two. Great. So maybe uh, let's maybe look at something interesting, the actual implementation of a monad for the maybe, because it's actually really easy. So we have this bind operator here and we do a uh, matching. I don't think I've mentioned this in the series, but this is also a way of doing uh, pattern matching. And here we match the M to nothing, and in this case, we just return a nothing. And if we have a just of x, we apply the function to it, right? This is exactly what bind should do. And a return of any value is just a, well, just of that value. Great. So this is how a monad can be instantiated. And, and if you have your own type, uh, for example, for a random number generator or for something that has to hold a state, you can use it just like this. Okay, so we've talked about the most important thing, the bind. Let's talk about this one, fail. What does that do? Well, fail is often not implemented and you don't have to implement it if you don't want to. It takes a string and then ret uh, returns a monad. Now, the funny thing is that um, the default implementation is that fail passes the string to the function error. And error doesn't return a monad. It actually just ends your program right there with an exception. So yeah, fail is used in order to have some 
well, error in your program pop up. For example, let's say you do some network code and some exception shouldn't happen, like um, a socket gets closed prematurely, for example, then you can just call fail, for example. And if your monad can handle that, if your monad can handle the error code and then somehow encode it in its monad, that's great because then you get a monad. But if it doesn't implement the fail function, it will just pass it to error and just end the program right there. Okay, so that's fail. We've talked about return and bind. Let's talk about the last one. I don't think this has a special name. At least I didn't find one. Um, the greater greater. So what is the greater greater? Well, I will call this the anonymous bind uh, or the unbind. Uh, I don't know. Well, let's look at its implementation. Its default implementation often never changes. It's the following. M to N is nothing but binding M to an anonymous function where we drop the, um, the name for this argument. So we just ignore the value that we get and just continue with whatever we wanted to do. The important thing is that let's say a faulty state happened in M, then this faulty state is propagated through, right? So then we don't even go into this uh, anonymous function. But if everything was all right, we just ignore its value. So we can see here that if something went wrong, right? So nothing just means something went wrong now. Uh, if something went wrong right at the beginning, we don't return just one, we return nothing. But if we have something like this, where like the second case where we have a just one, so something went right, and then a just two, then we return just two. And of course, if we have just one and we want to return a nothing, we return a nothing. So what is this used for? Why do we need it? Well, an act uh, with the anonymous bind to some expression is the same as doing it in the do notation with just no regard for the value we get back. Where do we need this? Well, for example, put string ln and put char and all of those output functions. That's a, a typical use case where we don't care what the return is, but we still want to do some error checking, right? Because this put string ln could fail. And in this case, we should propagate this error through. Um, and this function does just that, but it's just not as messy with... Um, putting a name on every value that we get because for example in the case of put string ln we have an io of the empty tuple and we already know what that value is it will be the empty tuple so that's a case where we just want to ignore that value and that's how we do it with this operator uh, now you don't have to define this operator again it's just automatically defined with the default implementation that we have right here okay so now we're almost done Let's talk about the monad laws, because there are some laws that if you have a monad, um, your monad should uh, abide by these laws. So let's look at this. The left identity is the following. Returning A and then A bind to K should be the same as KA, because return A should return just that, the A. Right? It should return a monad with the encapsulated value a and throw that to the function k. So that would be the same as just throwing that value to the function k. Right? It should be the same. Okay, so let's look at the right identity where we have some monad which we bind to return. Well, of course, we get the value from that m and then we put it into return, which in that case should just return the monad. The important thing is that this has to be the same m, right? Internal states shouldn't change. This identity should be kept alive. So, and lastly, monads should be associative or the bind operator should be associative. It shouldn't matter whether you first bind m to some function k and then bind that to h uh, or if you do it the other way around where you say, well, m is bound to this uh, function that uh, takes this argument then, you know, does the, does, does the um, actual binding operator. Uh, this just shouldn't matter. The, the uh, way of, of doing this... Um, evaluation should be irrelevant. Okay.